This is lesson 13 entitled Interesting Insects. Although all insects are interesting, the ones we will study in this lesson, praying mantises, dragonflies, grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, aphids, and cicadas, not shadow. Don't mind shadow, she just wanted to say hi to you all. She misses you guys seeing her. Are especially fun to find in nature. Most of these creatures can be seen all summer long, if you know where to look. Praying mantises. Scientists don't agree on the classification of praying mantises, which are also called praying mantids, or sometimes just mantids. Some put them in the same order as cockroaches and call it Dictyoptera. Others put them with crickets and grasshoppers into an order called Orthoptera. Other scientists think they need to belong to their own order, and they typically call this order Mantodea. Many scientists com compromise by putting praying mantises in either Dictyoptera or Orthoptera. And then say that they belong to their own special subgroup within that order called Mantodea. With hands folded up in a prayer-like fashion, a praying mantis is really a praying mantis, like preying on its prey that it eats and devours. Any moving creature smaller than itself is fair game for a quick meal. And since praying mantises can grow quite lengthy when they are full grown, most insects are in danger. In some cases, praying mantises even eat things like salamanders, toads, frogs, lizards, and hummingbirds. That makes me sad. I like hummingbirds. They s learn to sit still on a plant and wait, and wait, and wait, without moving an inch. The first insect that gets within grabbing distance experiences the unfortunate result of being snatched up by long arms of the still, silent predator. Their prey doesn't have a chance, for the mantis's front legs are spiked and endowed with claws that hook onto the creature. In addition to the advantage of claws and spikes, a praying mantis can turn its head from one side to the other, just like you can turn your head to look both ways before you cross the street. This makes it very easy for the praying mantis to look for an insect upon which to pounce. No other insect can do this with its head, which is one more reason that praying mantis is one of the best hunters in class insecta. Since mantids prey on insects that are harmful to crops, they are considered beneficial, except for hummingbirds. That's not okay. You can even order live praying mantises for insect control. Interestingly enough, praying mantises are such ferocious predators that they sometimes eat other praying mantises even those of the same species. This is called cannibalism. And praying mantises are often referred to the cannibalistic insects. Yay. I told you in a previous lesson that when a praying mantis nymph acts, they sometimes eat other nymphs that come in the same egg case. Lovely. Also, in some cases, a female will eat the male after they mate. Also lovely. This is definitely not a nice thing to do. Shadow didn't think it was very nice to do either. It doesn't happen all the time or with all praying mantises, but it does happen, especially when the female is hungry. So. <laughs> dragonflies and damselflies. <laughs> As you may have guessed, dragonflies and damselflies are not flies. They're in their own special order called Odonata. Odonata comes from the Greek word od odontos, which means tooth. Of course, insects don't really have teeth, but the mandibles that make up the chewing mouths of dragonflies are sharp and jagged, which make it look like they have teeth. You can usually find the adults flying around in search of prey near bodies of water like ponds, lakes, and streams. Dragonflies and damselflies have many similarities. Neither dragonflies nor damselflies can lay their wings flat against their backs as most other insects do. They both have large and beautiful transparent wings with intricate veins throughout. In addition, each of them has an abdomen that is a lot longer than the rest of the body. Even though they have a lot in common, 
Damselflies and dragonflies are put in different families within order Odonata, which is because there are differences between them as well. An adult damselfly, for example, has thinner, more delicate bodies than those of the dragonflies. Also, while resting, adult damselflies fold their wings together over their backs, while dragonflies hold their wings spread out. Winging it. God gave the beautiful dragonflies and damselflies an amazing gift, the ability to fly backward. They can also hover in midair for as long as they like, and they can take off at speeds of up to 35 miles per hour. How can they do such amazing feats? Well, unlike most other insects, the insects in this order can move each of their four wings independently. This gives these little creatures amazing flying abilities. Research, researchers have learned that these insects bend and twist their wings in just the right way to cause little whirlwinds that move air even faster over the upper part of the airfoil, reducing air pressure even more than most flying animals can. This, of course, gives them a mighty lift, even in the face of powerful winds. Did you know that the United States Navy and Air Force pay researchers to study dragonflies? in hopes of learning how to create a similar flying machine. Very cool. Seeing more than double. Along with these amazing flight capabilities, members of Order Odonata have tremendous eyesight. These two combined make it very hard to catch one. Birds, kids, entomologists alike have trouble netting the dragonfly. Their compound eyes are very large and have have up to 50,000 individual lens lenses. Whew. In dragonflies, the eyes are so large that they wrap all the way around the top of the head. As a result, they can see almost everywhere at once. A dragonfly can still be looking at you even after it flies by. Even though damselflies have large eyes, they're not quite as large as those of a dragonfly, so they don't wrap all the way around the head. Most insects can be caught by swinging a net at them from the front before they fly away. If you, can, if you try to catch a dragonfly from its front, it can easily avoid your net. The best way to catch a dragonfly is to let it fly by and then swing your net like a baseball bat after it. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Feeding on the fly. Dragonflies and damselflies can catch other insects while flying. They grab their prey with their legs, and then, which have thorny bristles to ensure the unfortunate insect. If the insect is small, they can eat as they fly. If the insect is large, they can lock their legs together to form a basket to carry the prey to a place where they can perch and eat in smaller chunks. Dragonflies and damselflies will even steal food from a spider's web. Hmm. Consider this story which comes from the article in Creation Magazine. For several minutes I stalked this little creature. As it fluttered from plant to plant. My plan was to get close enough for a good picture. Eventually, after the damselfly had threaded its way through the tangled stems, leaves, and flowers, it passed within a meter, which is about three feet, of a small spider's web that had a tiny object near its center. Then something very unusual happened. The damselfly hovered about 30 centimeters, one foot, in front of the web, seeming to study the spider's lair. Then, after a few seconds, it ever so deliberately <laughs> moved forward until wham! It was caught headfirst right where the object was in the web. What a picture will thi this will make, I exclaimed to myself as I thought, how clumsy this little fellow was to do such a thing. To my surprise, however, even though it looked like its head was hopelessly stuck in the silk sticky silk, it kept flying. The damsel hovered in place while tugging and tugging on the web until, pop, it broke free, taking with it the object that was in the web. Soon I discovered that this little acrobatic thief had stolen the spider's meal out of the spider's web without getting snagged itself. And that's by Tom Wagner, the acrobatic damselfly, a wonderful creation of God. As you can tell, these amazing creatures are excellent hunters whether they are grabbing insects right out of the air or stealing the prey of other animals. Now we're going to look at water babies, which are the naive. 
As you've already learned, dragonflies and damselflies experience incomplete metamorphosis with a twist. The nymphs, called naids, swim and live underwater, like fish. The female dragonfly lays her fertilized eggs near or right in the water. The naids, which don't look much like the dragonflies at all, hatch and immediately take to the water. While living in the water, the naids gorge themselves on aquatic insects as well as other small living creatures like tadpoles and minnows. Hidden in the muck and mire, a naid will lie in wait for little creatures to swim by. It can then squeeze water off its rear of its abdomen like a jet stream. This propels the naids forward very quickly, allowing it to snatch its prey with its powerful jaws. Some naids even take a long lower jaw that can shoot out and grab prey. These carnivorous nymphs live in water for weeks, or even years in some species, and undergo a series of molts to grow. When a naid is ready for its final molt, it finds a stick or other object projecting out of the water, crawls out of the water, and waits for its exoskeleton to dry. As the exoskeleton cracks open at the seam, the beautiful adult dragonfly, or damselfly, crawls out. Now we're going to look at crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids. Like praying mantises, the animals in order Orthoptera begin life inside an egg case. After three weeks, or when spring arrives, the tiny nymphs emerge from the egg case and begin life with greedy appetite. At large of emergence, you may at the time of emergence, you may find a fee, field littered with tiny little nymphs numbering in the thousands. After four or five molts, they will have wings that allow them to take flight. This signals that they are adults and ready to reproduce. Ortho means straight. Orthoptera means straight wings. This refers to the front wings called teg tegmina. Tegmena. Tegmena. Mina, mina. That are stiff and straight and not used for flying. The black wings are membranous and are folded like a fan under the front wings when the creature is not flying. Many use their wings to make sounds, which can generally call chirping noises. They make these sounds by rubbing one body part against another, which is called stridulation. Grasshoppers typically stridulate by scratching a comb-like structure on their back legs against their wing or abdomen. It's a little bit like running a stick along a fence. Crickets and katydids often stridulate by rubbing a comb-like scraper on a front wing against a file on the other front wing. Grasshoppers and katydids tend to buzz more than chirp. Grasshoppers tend to buzz during the day, and katydids usually get started in the late afternoon and continue until late into the night. Crickets, of course, charm us with their sweet chirps in the evening hours and through the night. Every species makes its own unique sound, and in most cases, only the male sings. He does so to attract females or to warn other males to stay away. Crickets have shorter wings than grasshoppers and katydids, so their chirping is higher and more pleasant to our ears. In China, singing crickets are so loved that they are sold as pets in tiny baskets from street vendors. People keep them just to listen to their nice sound. Would you believe that a cricket can serve as a thermometer? It's true. Scientists have learned that a cricket, specifically the snowy tree cricket, chirps more when it's warmer and less when it's cooler. In fact, if you count the number of chirps in a 15-second period and then add 40 to that number, you get a number that is pretty close to the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Isn't that amazing? So, try this at home. To understand how a shorter wing can make a higher sound than a lower wing, get a drinking glass that is reasonably tall. Fill it about one-third full of water using a small spoon Gently tap the edge of the glass lip to hear a ringing sound. Now add water so that it's nearly half full. Make a guess as to whether the pitch of the sound will be higher or lower when you tap the glass. Now tap the same way you did before. Which sound was higher in pitch? Add more water until, water until the glass is about three-fourths full. Once again, tap the glass. What happened? The more water you added to the glass, the lower the pitch of the sound. Why? Well, the glass makes sound because the glass and the water and the water inside it vibrate. The more water you had in the glass, the longer the column of water was that vibrated in the glass. You found out that the longer the column of water, the lower the pitch of the sound. 
This means that the shorter the column of water, the higher the pitch of the sound. It is essentially the same with crickets and grasshoppers. The shorter the wings, the shorter the length of the thing that is vibrating. So the higher the pitch of the sound. Hearing legs and abdomens. With all the chirping these animals do, they need to be able to hear. Do they have ears? Yes, in a way. Unlike you and me, however, their ears are called timpana. They are not in their heads. Crickets, katydids, and some grasshoppers have timpana on their, uh, on their front legs. Many grasshoppers have their timpana on the front segment of their abdomen instead. The timpana, singular of timpanum, singular of timpana, is a little hole with a thin membrane covering it. This is its eardrum, which vibrates when sound hit it. Of course, it can't really be called an eardrum if it's not in an ear, can it? Should it be called a leg drum or an abdomen drum? Chomp and chew. Members of the order Orthoptera chew their food. If you watch one closely, you can see that its jaws, or mandibles, move sideways as it chews, not up and down like human jaws do. Crickets are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and animals. In fact, they'll eat almost anything. Vegetables, cereal, and even their mate if they're hungry enough. Katydids are mostly herbivores, which means they eat plants. However, they will eat aphids and other small, slow-moving insects, as well as an insect eggs from, from time to time. If very hungry, they might also eat their mate. It's very dangerous to be a mate in the uh, insect world. Grasshoppers, on the other hand, are pretty strict herbivores. Go grasshoppers. If you have one as a pet, feed it fresh grass, wheat bran, and lettuce. The fact that grasshoppers are herbivores is not necessarily good. Mm, true. They can be terrible crop pests, especially if they swarm. Most grasshoppers don't swarm, and therefore they don't do too much damage. But the swarmers, called locusts, can destroy thousands of crops in very little time. You probably heard of locusts from the Bible. You can check out that in Exodus 10. Swarming. Even though locusts are identified as swarming grasshoppers, swarming is not their typical behavior. Generally, they lead happy, solitary lives, visiting with other locusts only when they are ready to mate. However, if foods become scarce, they tend to gather together around whatever food sources are left. As the number of locusts in a region begins to increase, a change in their behavior occurs and they swarm. Now please realize that swarming in locusts is not the same as swarming in ants. When ants swarm, it is to mate. When locusts swarm, they are moving from one place to another in a huge group. People that have lived through a locust swarm report that they saw what appeared to be a huge dark cloud up in the sky, slowly coming down to the earth. As they watched in perplexed amazement, they began to hear a faint noise that grew louder and louder as the cloud drew closer and closer. Swiftly, they would see that the cloud was really a huge group of locusts that would land covering hundreds of miles of vegetation. Amazingly, scientists have estimated that there can be more than 100 million locusts in each square mile. That many locusts can completely destroy vast areas of crops and other plants in only a few hours. We can look at leg power. Have you ever tried to catch a cricket, grasshopper, or Katie did? I know you guys have caught at least grasshoppers and crickets before. It is hard, isn't it? For some people, maybe not for all of you. As you slowly approach one, it's suddenly gone. You look around and see it a few feet away. The only way to catch it is to pounce on it quickly. These insects are hard to catch because God designed them with amazing legs so they can really jump. In fact, a grasshopper can jump 20 times farther than the length of its body. If you can jump like a grasshopper, how far would you? So have an adult measure how tall you are and multiply by 20. Don't you wish you could jump that far? It'd be awesome. If you study the insects in this order, you'll notice how very large and long their back legs are. These strong, long, strong legs give these insects their amazing ability to jump. Differences among crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids. Crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers belong to the same order because they have many things in common. However, they are all different creatures. 
so it is important to be able to tell them apart. There are several different things you can look for in order to help you decide whether a member of this order is a grasshopper, a cricket, or a katydid. First, you can look at the coloration. Since grasshoppers are active during the day, they tend to be colored so as to blend in with the grass or brightly colored flowers. As a result, they tend to be either green, light brown, or multicolored. Crickets, however, are active, active at night. As a result, they tend to be dark so as to blend, with, blend in with the shadows. Since katydids spend a lot of time on leaves, they are often leaf covered, colored and their wings look like leaves. Second, you can look at the antennae. Katydids and crickets tend to have long antennae, while grasshoppers tend to have short ones. In general, katydids have the thinnest antenna. Crickets have slightly thicker antennae, and grasshoppers have the thickest antennae. Third, you can look at behavior. In general, grasshoppers are active all day, while katydids tend to be active in the late afternoon and evening. Crickets tend to be active all night. Now, it is important to realize that there are exceptions to these general rules. For example, even though grasshoppers usually have thick antennae, the longhorn grasshopper has long, thin antennae, much like those of the cricket. As a result, it's sometimes hard to tell the members of this order apart. Nevertheless, try it yourself. For each picture below, indicate whether you're looking at a grasshopper, Katie did, or cricket. And I'm sure you guys will ace this very easily. Dangerous and defense. Birds, wasps, mammals, Amphibians, reptiles, spiders, and other insects love to dine on members of Order Orthoptera. Another very disgusting danger for these insects comes from certain species of flesh flies and uh, tech technidid flies. These flies lay their eggs on the back of the cricket or grasshopper. When the eggs hatch, the larvae eat their way into the body of the creature and live off it of its innards. That's terrible. How do members of this order protect themselves from these dangers? Well, their primary means of defense is to simply jump or fly away, and or fly away. If that doesn't work, grasshoppers are actually equipped with one important defense. Do you remember they vomit a stinking juice called tobacco juice when they are threatened? If you catch a grasshopper, don't be surprised if it vomits tobacco juice on you. You may even be able to make it vomit the juice if you prod it enough. Of course, camouflage is also a defense. God made kitty does look so much like leaves that they are rarely seen by the casual observer. Their wings have the same vein patterns as leaves, and they often have imperfections and blemishes like the ones you might find on a leaf. They are very convincing imitators and well protected with this defense. Looking for members of Order Orthoptera. Hunting for these insects is a lot of fun. During the summer months, grasshoppers are easy to find. Look for them in tall grass, weedy fields, gardens, or crops. A grasshopper might even startle you when it hops away from you as you walk by. You can even try to catch one. Although you can try to catch members of this order with your hands, you will probably have more success if you use a net. One of the best nets to use is a sweep net, which is designed to be swept through plants so it can pick up the insects living there. The course website mentioned in the introduction to this book has links to places where you can buy a sweep net. I don't know if you guys might need that. You might be expert enough. You don't even need it. Aphids. Now we will reach another example of insects that cause scientists to disagree. Aphids and cicadas are often put in their own order, called Homoptera. Homo Homoptera. However, other scientists think that they are similar enough to true bugs that they should be in in their order, Hemiptera. Now remember, order Hemiptera gets its name from the fact that true bugs have front wings that start off thick and tough, but in the end are thin and membranous. Aphids and cicadas have front wings that are the same throughout, however. In fact, that's why Homoptera means. As a result, even scientists that put aphids and cicada in order Hemiptera still put them in a subgroup of order of Hemiptera, and even they call this subgroup Homoptera. The big disagreement then is whether aphids and cicadas deserve their own order or should be considered a subgroup of true bugs. I think they deserve their own order, since their wings don't look like those of a true bug. Aphids are tiny pests to gardeners and farmers alike. They come in many different colors, mostly green or red. Like all members of order Homoptera, they have piercing and sucking mouthing parts so they can cut into a plant and suck the sap out of it. This, of course, can kill the plant. Some species also produce destructive galls on trees. 
Because they plague plants, they are also called plant lights. These insects have a very complex life cycle. Some will overwinter an egg and hatch in the spring. Typically, these eggs produce wingless females whose eggs develop and hatch inside their bodies. When a colony of aphids gets too crowded, winged aphids are produced, and they leave to start a new colony somewhere else. This kind of reproduction can produce huge populations. At any given time, a farmer may have more than four tons of aphids in one field. Late in the summer, males and females mate, and the females lay eggs that will overwinter to start the process all over again. Remember that aphids are often kept by ants. They produce honeydew for ants, and the ants protect them. Ladybugs are the aphids' greatest predator, though other insects will feed on them as well. Some wasps lay their eggs inside an aphid's body. When the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the aphid's internal organs, slowly killing the aphid. Now we're moving on to cicadas. Have you ever heard an extremely low buzzing coming from high in the trees on a warm summer day? It may have been the result of cicadas. They're the loudest of all insects and be heard from more than 400 miles away. The buzz you hear is the male calling to the female using the vibrating panels called timbles on his side. When the female who isn't able to buzz hears the buzz of a male, she searches for him. After they mate, the female will use her oviposter to cut a slit in the branch of a tree and lay her eggs there. Adult cicadas often don't eat anything, and they don't bite. So they don't cause much damage except for that egg-laying business, and they are safe to, to collect and study. They live for only a few weeks, however, so they can be hard to find. After the eggs in the tree hatch, the newborn nymphs instinctively drop to the ground and burrow down into the soil where they feed on sap and plant roots. They live like that for a long, long time. Some live underground for two to seven years, and they are called dog day cicadas or annual cicadas. They are typically green or black. Once the cicada nymph crawls out of the ground, they crawl up on a plant and molt for the last time, emerging as winged adults. Even though they stay in the ground for more than a year, they are not synchronized, so you can usually find adults every year. Of course, since they don't live for very long as adults, you often don't see them. However, you can usually find the empty exoskeleton called cast from the final molt. Have you ever found one? I don't know if we have those here, but yeah, it's possible. Adult cicadas don't have any defenses except their ability to fly. When facing a predator that also flies, the adult cicada usually becomes a meal. So as cicadas emerge, many are eaten by birds, bats, and other insects. In fact, some people eat cicadas. A certain kind of wasp called the cicada killer will place cicadas inside its nets for the hatching larvae, larvae to feed on. Periodical cicadas are a bit different from annual cicadas because the nymphs stay around underground for 17 years. Ooh, 13 for some species. In addition, the broods are mostly synchronized, so most of them tend to emerge at once every 13 or 17 years. This results in enormous droves of periodical cicadas. When the males all start singing, it produces quite a racket. The buzzing is incredibly loud because the cicadas are simply everywhere. Thankfully, this only happens once every 13 or 17 years. The periodical cicadas can be identified by their back bodies with red eyes and orange legs. Periodical cicadas are generally found in the eastern parts of North America. The 17-year cicadas tend to live in northeast, while the 13-year cicadas live in the southeast and midwest. Like other cicadas, the adults live for only a few weeks. A period of 13 or 17 years as a youngster, a nymph, and only a few weeks as an adult is quite unlike our lives. Nevertheless, it's normal for these interesting creatures. Periodical cicadas give us excellent evidence that they, are, they were designed by Almighty God. Think about it. The nymphs stay underground for 17 or 13 years, and then all of a sudden, they all emerge from the ground. This happens for miles around even though the nymphs have no means of communicating with one another, as far as we know. Of course, it seems impossible for us to imagine what causes millions of creatures to know to emerge within days of one another over an entire region of the country. Nevertheless, it happens. As far as we can tell, cicadas have a built-in clock and present programming, so they know when to emerge. How did they get these clocks in this programming? We know from experience that it takes intelligence to make clocks and program computers. These things don't happen by chance. The clocks and programming and periodical cicadas tell us that they were made by an intelligent, amazing creator. And that is all for this lesson. 
So be sure to work on your workbooks and get that all done. And I hope you enjoyed it.